Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I'm delighted to see so many of you here this morning. We had a little bit of a problem with space, but look at this nice hall with the, with the sun coming in. <laughs> um, and you know which day it is today. It's the 12th of February. No special day. It's two days before Valentine's Day, though. And on Valentine's Day, we always have a good opportunity to define new relationships, to talk about the future. And that's what we're here today, to talk about the future. The UK left the EU 12 days ago, and it's business as usual now, until the end of this year. However, it's crucial for a business that there will be a good trade relationship in the future. And that's what we plan to discuss today. We have a lot of interesting speakers from the UK and Slovenia. And it is my pleasure to introduce first Her Excellency, the British Ambassador to Slovenia, Ms. Sophie Honey. Um, thank you, Barbara. Uh, morning, everyone. Dobrodošli u sem, u si. Me veseli, da smo danes skupaj. Uh, okay. In uh, to the najlepša vala gospodarski zbornici, da danes nas gosti. Jaz vedno se 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 veseljem pogovarjem z slovenskimi podjetji in kolegi, ki poslujete z Veliko Britanjo ker imam vedno občutek, da se vse da in da nič ni nemogoče. I think today we chose the right room. I've been a lot to Gozesa before, but I haven't been upstairs here before, and I think this room with a fabulous, bright view is the right room to be in today when we're looking ahead and thinking about the future. Res je tudi, da se je poslovanje med državama v zadnjih tre leti povečalo za več kot deset odstotkov in da sodelujemo na veliko področji, od gradbeništva do bančistva do visoke tehnologije. Zato najlepša hvala za vse, ka počnete. Želim si, da bi še naprej skupaj rasli, Današnji dogodek je tako priložnost za pogled v prihodnost. Želim si tudi zahvaliti kolegom iz slovenske vlade, ki ste danes z nami, in tudi mojemu kolegu in predstavniku Evropske unije, Zoranu Stančiču. Kje je Zoran? Ja, Zoran, hvala. By the way, za prešereno dan sem posnela kratek video. Mogoče nekaj od vas, ga ste videli. In sem govorila o grozni slovenci slovnici. Ampak kako sem kljub temu zaljubila v Slovenšino. Zato se mi zdelo fino, da vsaj na začetku govorim po slovensko. Čeprav vem, da vsi tukaj govorite odlično angleško. Ampak najlepša hvala za potrpežljivost. To je zelo težko. in podporo. Zdaj pa k reznim stvarem. Kot veste, je Združeno kraljestvo zdaj zapustila Evropsko unijo. Prehodno obdobje bo trajalo do konca leta. Dogovori glede poslovanja med Združenim kraljestvo in Evropsko unijo ostajajo do tega, takrat enaki. Pogajanja o novem odnosu 
med Združenim kraljestvo in Evropsko unijo se bojo k malu začela. Želimo si podoben sporazum o prosti trgovini, kot ga ima Evropska unija z Kanado. Mogoče ste slišali govoriti o izivih tega, ampak prepričani smo, da se lahko sporazumemo do konca leta. Če se spomnimo, so decembra lani vsi rekli, da do sporazuma ne bo prišlo, ampak je. To pomeni, da se bodo konec decembra 2020 na področju poslovanja zgodile pomembne sprememembe. Združenjo kraljestvo bo izstopilo iz skupnega trga in carinske unije. To pomeni, da bodo v prihodnje izvozniki in uvozniki morali upoštevati nove postopke. Zato sem povabila moja kolega Tima, da bi nam nadalje razložil, kako postavljamo postopati že zdaj in kakšne oblike pomoči vam bodo na voljo v prihodnje. Ljudje so me oprašali tudi, kaj se bo zgodilo, če ne bo prišlo do trgovinskega sporazuma. Mislimo, da lahko absolutno dosežemo sporazum, ampak tudi, če se to ne zgodi, se bo poslo poslovanje nadaljevalo v okviru obstoječega sporazuma. Mi pa vam bomo pomagali z vsemi informacijami, ki ji izvozniki in uvozniki potrebujete. Tako da upam, da boste danes dobili koristne informacije in da bo slovensko-britansko trgovanje še naprej tako lepo raslo. Hvala. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Tim in a minute, who's kindly um, come out from London uh, to join us today um, to explain a little bit more about the free trade agreement that we are looking to agree. I, I hope my Slovene uh, je bilo dovolj, <laughs> da ste razumeli, more or less, but um, <laughs> I'm going to ask Tim to say uh, a little bit more about that, about our goals for this year and for the future looking ahead. Um, and I'm also going to ask him to give you a steer uh, on the steps that you can take um, to prepare. Um, but once again, thank you so much. Uh, I really mean what I said. It's always brilliant for me to um, be in this room with so many Slovene businesses who are exporting to the UK, importing to the UK, have different kind of partnerships, uh, and to feel a sense of optimism and can do about the future, um, that whatever the future holds, we will continue to grow our trade. So thank you, and thank you for coming. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Sophie, and, and Dobadan to uh, everyone here. Um, but I think that will be the, the extent of my, uh, my Slovene. So uh, forgive me if I uh, repeat some of the, uh, the things that the, uh, the ambassador has said. But it is, it's great to be here. Um, it is by no means the first time I have uh, uh, been here in, uh, in Ljubljana, uh, Slovenia. Uh, I was uh, one of my very favorite countries when uh, I was uh, in charge of uh, the, uh, the UK uh, economics ministry's uh, efforts to help the countries of Central and Eastern Europe uh, enter the EU uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the century. Uh, and uh, it's always been a pleasure to come uh, to Slovenia, be it on business, uh, or indeed on pleasure. Uh, I'm, I've been here several times uh, uh, on, on holiday uh, and explored your, your lovely country. Uh, 
indeed, I was here on the 1st of May 2004, which, uh, for those of you um, old enough to remember, was the, uh, the day that, uh, that Slovenia actually entered the European Union. So I, I can well remember the, the celebrations in, uh, in Kongresny uh, Square on that, on that very day. So it is perhaps a little ironic that I'm uh, here talking to you about the consequences uh, of the UK leaving the EU. Uh, but as the ambassador says, um, uh, this is a time for looking forward, uh, a time for uh, preparing for a new, different, but no less close, I hope, uh, relationship between uh, the UK and Slovenia and UK businesses and, and Slovenian uh, businesses. So, as, uh, as the ambassador said, uh, nothing will change in terms of terms of trade this year, but uh, come the 1st of January next year, uh, the UK is leaving the single market uh, and it's leaving uh, the customs union. Uh, now, that is, is, is bringing the UK uh, away, but you know, in a sense, I certainly want to reassure you that, that we want to continue and strengthen all those commercial ties. And, and uh, there are a lot of people here, but I know there are even more um, people across Slovenia who are doing business with the UK, uh, that the UK is very much open for business and wants to um, continue and, and strengthen its, its economic ties, commercial ties with Slovenia and the whole of the, of the EU. Uh, we want a friendly relationship with the EU based on free trade and mutual cooperation. Uh, and the basis of that cooperation should be a free trade agreement reflecting a wide range of, of shared interests. We want this trade agreement to be based on international best practice in existing free trade agreements that the EU have with other countries. And in particular, we want an agreement with no tariffs, uh, no quotas, and uh, a, uh, a deep um, agreement on, on services. In short, we want an agreement which minimizes new barriers to trade in goods services and investment. Uh, and as with other free trade agreements that the, the European uh, Union has with third countries, we will not be aligning the UK with EU law and regulations, but as our strong record shows, we in the UK will continue to have high standards uh, in areas such as environmental protection, workers' rights, animal waste, welfare, where in many cases we already go beyond what the EU rules uh, require. So as Sophie was saying, that is what we want from the FTA, from the UK. Now, what does this mean, mean for you? Well, um, as I say, during the transition period, there will be no change, but it is an opportunity, time for those trading with the UK to prepare for the 1st of January next year when things will change. The UK will become a third country and trading with us will require new procedures. The extent of those changes and the, any extra checks or declarations, paperwork, etc., will of course depend on the terms of the free trade agreement. Um, but this is not some horrific unknown thing. A lot of you will be very familiar with trading with other countries outside the European Union, uh, and the uh, trading with the UK is is not going to be very much different uh, from that. Those of you who are not familiar with trading outside the European Union should start getting ready now, talking to your UK customers or suppliers, 
understanding the procedures that are likely to be required. And of course, the British Slovenian Chamber and the British Embassy, as the ambassador said, are sources of information, of help, and this is why you're here today, I think, because, uh, because, of, because of that, and that help will obviously continue during the course of the year. In your uh, papers, uh, you should have a, a, a one-sheet um, page about a new, a new tool, um, a, uh, a web-based tool run by the British government, gov.uk, uh, and that will help those of you trading with the UK to be able to look up products and find out exactly if there are tariffs or taxes uh, imposed. As I say, we hope there won't be, um, but all the details about trading will be on that, uh, on that tool on the website and you can start looking at it, uh, it straight away. So, in summary, uh, trading with the UK will be different from the 1st of January. But both the UK and the EU have committed to aim for no tariffs and no quotas. It's in all our interests for trade to be as frictionless as possible. And from what I have gathered and I know that Slovenian businesses will manage whatever changes do come up, and particularly if you start preparing now. So thank you very much indeed. Havala, and I will look forward to answering some more questions in the panel afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador and Tim Abrahams. Now, going back to Valentine's Day, it always takes two to tango, so I'm glad that we also have representation of the EU here this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Mr. Zoran Stancic, head of the EU Commission in Slovenia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador, Your Excellencies. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, this is not the place to engage in negotiations, uh, so uh, I would like just to kick off by uh, stating very clearly that uh, we as European Commission uh, we, of course, respect the decision of uh, UK people, but at the same time, I want to underline that we very much regret that uh, the decision of the UK to leave the European Union uh, has been made. Uh, and as, as it has been said earlier, um, we are now in a position where, until the end of this year, things are pretty much clear. So we will be working, uh, essentially, pretty much as business as usual, with the exception that uh, our UK friends will not engage in the decision-making process in this uh, time, uh, either in the Parliament or in the Council. So I think now we are in a very comfortable position. However, looking ahead, we have now 11 months in front of us where we have to agree about our future relations. And just for illustration to show you the extent and the complexity of this relationship, uh, maybe uh, two figures. Uh, European Union, for European Union member states, 27, uh, trade of goods and services uh, with uh, UK uh, is about 8% of the all trade of goods and services the EU member states do, 8%. On the other side, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, trade of goods and services of the UK with the European Union represents about 50% uh, of their trade of goods and services. So this is just a figure I want you to have in mind, that you have in mind to understand the possible implications of what could happen for the EU and for the UK if we do not agree right about our future relationship. Uh, as it has been stated by uh, my political masters, uh, 
uh, we are very much ambition, we have very high ambition regarding future relations, relationship. Uh, President Ursula von der Leyen stated very clearly yesterday in the parliament that we should aim very high regarding our future relationship. Uh, and I think in this respect, uh, also what is important that you bear in mind is that uh, European Council guidelines adopted in March 2018 also uh, put the ambition very high. It has been stated that uh, future partnership will include provisions for, of direct interest to citizens and businesses in areas such as transport, industrial supply chains, uh, agricultural products, fisheries, services, data protection, provision for labor play playing field, mobility of citizens, uh, the fight against organized crime, money laundering, terrorism, uh, and foreign and security policy. So you see that the extent of our future relationship ambition is very, very high. Also, this has been repeated in a political declaration which is actually uh, which has been agreed uh, in October 2019 and which accompanies the withdrawal agreement. So, having stated that, where do we stand right now at the EU level? Commission proposes that we have what we call the association agreement with the, e, uh, with the UK. What does it mean? Uh, According to the treaty, uh, this is the instrument which we use in the cases where we want to have the highest possible relation, level of the relationship uh, with uh, other partners, um, involving reciprocal rights and obligations, common action and uh, special procedure. It is, it is, as I said, uh, the closest possible partnership with a country which is not part of the EU. Now, there are a couple of details there, there which I think are important. Uh, the association agreement, agreements in principle, according to the EU basic law, have to be adopted uh, by, uh, by the uh, unanimity in the Council, and they require the consent uh, of the European Parliament. Now, allow me just the brackets here. This is a bit different procedure-wise compared to CETA. Uh, as you know, for CETA with Canada, uh, we had uh, quite long negotiations lasting uh, more than five years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, it requires um, ratification in all EU member states. So association agreement is a bit different compared uh, to, um, uh, to this free trade agreement which we have with Canada. Uh, so. Um, what I think is important now is uh, uh, to clarify a couple of things regarding the, the, uh, the um, models of the agreement which we have. All the agreements which we have, one way or the other, all come not only with rights, but also with obligations on both sides. So um, if I translate this to statements, uh, in addition to what has been stated by, by, um, by Tim, uh, it's always consistently repeated that in addition to no quotas and no tariffs, what the EU wants to have is uh, no dumping. Now, how does this translate to the legal terms? Uh, essentially, uh, for a correct implementation and application of the future trade uh, uh, agreement, we also must have uh, an effective governance structure uh, and governance arrangements in place. Uh, where the future partnership relies on European Union law, uh, there must be a role for the European Court of Justice, as only the European Court of Justice can interpret EU law. Also regarding the fact that the EU choose to become a third country and thus to leave the single market, after the end of this transition period, the EU and UK will form a separate markets with, of course, this, uh, distinct legal orders and the future relationship will therefore result in a lower level of integration than uh, it is the case today. In this context, let me stress that uh, the trading under free trade agreement terms, uh, so-called best-in-class free trade agreements, is a very different nature compared to the frictionless trade uh, as we have it uh, in a single market. Um, 
in a free trade agreement context, rules of origin and customs formalities will apply. So all imports will need to comply with the rules of the importing party, be the UK or the EU, and will, subject of, will be subject, of course, to regulatory checks and controls for safety, for health, and also other policy um, uh, purposes. As uh, UK is no longer a member of the custom union and a single market, these processes will have to be implemented regardless of our agreement with the United Kingdom uh, and uh, in the political declaration where the uh, ambition, uh, where we clearly ambitioned uh, zero tariffs and zero quotas trade relations is for all goods. Because all these conditions um, are exceptional, this is conditioned on the uh, existence of robust provisions ensuring a level playing field, guaranteeing fair competition between the economic players uh, and economic operators from both sides. And in addition to that, uh, these exceptional conditions of no tariffs and no quotas across all sectors uh, can only be uh, tabled if fisheries agreement uh, includes provisions on access to uh, waters uh, on the EU, uh, UK side. Uh, so uh, let me conclude by saying that the Commission as will be a uh, European Union negotiator and we are ready to begin negotiation as soon as the Council authorizes us. Uh, on 25th of February, hopefully on the General Affairs Council, we will get uh, a green line from the EU member states to go ahead. Uh, then European Commission uh, will be working 24-7 uh, to make the best out of the negotiations and to achieve as much as possible during the transition period. Uh, all the processes on our side will be conducting, uh, conducted as always in a very transparent way. We have established a dedicated web page where all the materials will be published in real time. So you can Google it, you'll find it without any problems and everything will be transparent and you will get all the information. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, you see that the road in front of us is not going to be an easy one. Uh, and uh, 11 months is very short time and yes, it is possible to conclude the negotiation in that time or parts of the negotiations in that time. However, uh, we should be aware that if things don't go the way we would like on both sides to do it, uh, it is possible to extend the transition period by one or two years if the UK triggers that uh, before the 1st of July this year. Uh, we know that UK has unilaterally decided not to do it, but as I said, still there is a way to, to, to prolong the transition period. Let me just remind you that uh, concluding these uh, challenging neg negotiations will not be easy. So therefore, we should reflect that if we, are not be, if we will not be uh, successful in negotiations, in negotiations, we will face the cliff edge scenario uh, on 1st of January next year. We hope that this will not happen. However, because we went through this exercise already last year, I think it's just important to here and there remind us and actually renew our knowledge from that period. Th thank you very much. And we are looking forward for good discussion later on. Thank you, Mr. Stancic. Uh, there have been a lot of questions on the impact of Brexit on the British economy, the EU economy, and at the end also on the Slovenian economy because we depend so much on export. Uh, and it's my pleasure to announce the next two presenters who will talk about that. Boja Ivans from GZS and Jasha Redek from the Faculty of Economics. Thank you, Barbara, Your Excellency, distinguished guests. Um, so it's about 10 minutes of my presentation followed by Tiasha's presentation. So my focus will be more about the Brexit impacts uh, since referendum in, in June 2016 to the latest uh, data possible. So the latest data was possible finding for goods for October 2019 and for the services November 2019. 
So my focus was uh, to, to, to see what are the possible effects in terms of the exports and imports between our countries. And then I also uh, was looking at the sentiment indicator in manufacturing for Slovenia, if of course this also was possibly influenced uh, by the Brexit, uh, especially by the unknown ways uh, of, of how, how, how it evolved. Uh, and the third, uh, the third part of my analysis will be the FDI inflow outflow uh, between our two countries. Uh, so uh, let's focus on the main, uh, the main parts of the exports. So these are the exports of Slovenia to UK. Um, as you can see, there these are quite complex products that are exported to UK. So I would say the Slovenia has uh, generally a competitive advantage in complex manufacturing products, as well as you can see in pharmaceutical products. This is mainly generic uh, industry, as you know. Uh, so basically, these are the products that are mostly exported, and in total, they're, they're, they stand they stood at about 600 million euros in the last 12 months. And to see the other type of the balance, so this is the group, main groups of the imports that the Slovenian uh, companies import from the UK. And here you can see uh, the picture is a bit different. So these are the petroleum, petroleum products that are mostly imported. Uh, they represent about 16% of all the imports. And basically, you know, uh, there are about six refineries in UK. And basically, this is the, the export of those refineries to Slovenia, which are represented by this figure. And of course, on the other hand, there are also uh, other types of imports which are very relevant for Slovenian companies. These are different manufacturing articles as well as machinery. Also, uh, UK has a lot of competitive advantage in advanced machinery. And this is also, let's say, a part of the import which is very important. So to put those two numbers uh, in comparing them, we can see, for example, how much uh, the, the, the exports and imports have increased. And as you can see, um, the exports have increased by 10% in the last three years and imports by about 17%. So this figure is double digit, so uh, you would say it's quite good. On the other hand, the total exports of Slovenia in that same period have increased by 30% and the imports have increased by as well by about 30%. So what's the difference? Why do we trade less with the UK than with the other countries? So I figured out one reason would be uh, the, uh, the depreciation of, of pound sterling versus euro. Uh, it depreciated about s by about 7% in this period. The other, the other factor would be the uncertainty uh, in the island, and this probably caused less imports of investment goods from Slovenia. Um, and uh, of course, also the lower growth rate of the UK's economy also uh, accounted for part of this slower growth rate. Uh, the UK's economy growth rate was about 2% in 2016. And in the last year, this was just mentioned yesterday, this was the first release data, uh, it, uh, it, the, the growth rate has, uh, has, has fallen to about 1.4%. So the growth rate has, has gone down and probably with, with, with that also the level of exports to the UK. Uh, I also performed the attribution analysis. So what does that mean? I calculated which products, uh, which products explained the increase in exports and imports for this three-year period. And you can see the pharmaceutical products in case of, of Slovenia's exports were the most important. They accounted for 20% of that increase, followed by non-ferrous metals uh, and manufacturing, manufacturing articles of metals, whereas uh, we lost market share in electrical machinery. Uh, probably this also can be explained by, by, um, by, um, by fall in, in pound sterling, which of course made uh, the Slovenian exports less competitive on UK markets, so probably um, our, our white hood good producers and uh, the supplying industry connected with that lost a bit of market share. And on the other hand, uh, what is very interesting to see that th these were the petroleum products that, that were accountable for more than 110% of all the increase. So this, the exports of those products have increased by about 70 million euros since last three years. Uh, on the other hand, what is also particularly interesting is that the, ec that the imports of road vehicles uh, has fallen by, by two-thirds. That was for about 45 millions. So we bought less cars from UK uh, in, in the last year compared to the three years ago. So then, I focused, then my focus was on the services. So in the services, we're, let's say, uh, quite tight in terms of exports and imports. But as you can see, across the different types of services, 
Uh, the travel tourism is very important for Slovenia, followed by transport. So what is travel tourism? This is the expenditure of UK citizens in Slovenia. Um, and transport is, of course, this is the money which the, which the UK companies pay when they order a truck driver to bring goods to UK. Um, and on the, other on the other side, you can see in terms of the imports of services to Slovenia, the charges for the use of intellectual property are very important part of the services imports. So what do they represent? You probably know that UK has a patent box regime. What does that mean? That there is a reduced corporate tax rate on the intellectual property uh, products. And of course, there are many companies also from continental Europe, also from the US, which of course uh, use this regime and of course can sell the rights from the patents uh, to different countries. So uh, this is a great tool, of course, which the companies um, legitimately can use and of course do use it. And this of course represents a very important part of, of the imports. And then you can see the ICT services and other business services are also quite important. So there's a lot of consultancies, for example, also are part of these types of services which Slovenia imports. So quite a bit knowledge, knowledge intensive uh, types of imports which are important in, in terms of the services. So, in the last three years, as you can see, uh, the increase was very similar to the increase in goods, which is on one hand to expect, especially, let's say, in the transport sector, uh, which are, let's say, very quite tight to, to, the, to the goods sector. But, but what, what, I, what I found particularly striking is, for example, in terms of attribution analysis, that was, that was the tourism, the part which, which increased uh, the case in, in Slovenia's exports to the UK. So the, 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 um, the, the British, the UK citizens uh, spend more money uh, in Slovenia that contributed for the 50% of all the increase, followed by other business services, uh, whereas uh, the transport services and construction services have decreased. So, so those, those uh, types of services actually uh, lost market share on the UK's market. Uh, and on the other hand, as you can see in terms of the imports, attribution analysis, so are the charges for use of intellectual property are becoming more important, uh, whereas also other services are also very important. And, and you can see also here that the imports have increased more than the exports, which of course uh, is, can be explained by the depreciation of pound sterling. Uh, so, going forward, I was also looking at the data of the sentiment indicator in Slovenia's manufacturing. So what you can see here is that the industrial confidence indicator decreased. And of course, when I, when I sent this data to, to, to Mr. Giacomelli, he said to me, what does that mean for, for the Brexit, for, for our event? Well, honestly, it doesn't mean a lot. Of course, Brexit is also part of this puzzle of a decrease in the confidence. Uh, and of course, I would say the indirect effect was a bit more pronounced for Slovenia than a direct one. But of course, it is a quite very complex thing to distinguish only the Brexit uncertainty factor from the other factors, which also contributed to reduce confidence in industry. So I would say mostly it's the, it was the re reduced level of businesses for the UK as well as for, for, the, for the EU markets as well as for the world markets that were more important important than the Brexit, but I still wanted to show you this graph just to give you a, on, a perspective on that, how the manufacturing confidence is evolving in Slovenia. Uh, in terms of the FDI, what I found very particularly interesting is that since 2016, uh, actually the inward FDI, this is the FDI of UK's companies in Slovenia, has actually increased quite a lot, as you can see by 430 million euros to about 730 million. So that's quite a sum. So then I was thinking which were, let's say, big, very big in, in let's say, um, investments. Were there some very important greenfield investments or, or, or something? So I figured it out when I did a call to Bank of Slovenia representative, which is in charge of this data, that basically these are, let's say, the result of the company's decision uh, to have their, uh, their uh, um, their, their seat of, of their company in the UK because um, it, it makes them more competitive uh, based on the English law and also based on the taxation, taxation regime. So basically, uh, UK is still very competitive in this sector and what I, what I saw is interesting that the FDI from the US has fallen and of course part of, of the fall in the US and the increase in the 
in the UK part, of course, explains this, that the UK was, let's say, more competitive on having uh, established seat uh, in the UK that, of course, uh, also is in charge uh, of, of Slovenia. So this was, let's say, my, 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 my finding with regards to this data. In terms of the outward FDI, uh, there's this data is still statistically a bit insignificant. So usually Slovenian companies do not do not have manufacturing facility in UK. Uh, according to data from Bank of Slovenia, there are only about nine companies directly in UK with about 35 employees. I do believe the number is higher. Probably the statistics does not take uh, into consideration all all the companies. Uh, but still, y this is the data which is publicly available that we can discuss, and those companies represent about 50 million of sales, and these are mainly sales representative offices, so they're, let's say, capital light activities, activities which, of course, support the sales of the Slovenian companies. Uh, of course, also some Slovenian corporates open a daughter company in UK, but, of course, data for 2019 is not available yet. Uh, yeah, there are some open questions when, of course, I, I was looking at this data, is especially how reliable is data on the services. Uh, what I found interesting is, for example, Bank of Slovenia also performs revisions of data, and sp specifically for tourism, sometimes they are quite high. So, so my point here is, um, is maybe this data a bit, n not even a bit more higher uh, on how much the Slovenian spends in the UK because the official data is that we spend only about 20 million euros per annum in UK on tourism. I, I do believe that the number is a bit higher, but of course the statistics may show this three or four years after that. Um, then the sentiment indicator, of course, that I also mentioned, uh, is is giving, let's say, uh, different uh, is giving different um, types of events that are accountable uh, for the fall. And of course, the indirect effect of exports. I hope Tiasha will explain part of this puzzle because I believe at least uh, w uh, the exports of, of goods which are made indirectly represents the same amount also, but of course which is exported uh, indirectly through other European countries. Uh, and of course, the, my final point would be, uh, of course, which companies uh, are the decision makers on the exports and imports between the countries, for example, in case of intellectual property. Uh, so uh, this is also a very interesting. So my point here is, of course, this is that uh, the, 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 the businesses are very satisfied with the business environment, of course, take the decisions based on their economic interests, and in this case, I would say the UK has a very big competitive advantage versus the continental Europe, and probably it will retain it. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, for listening to me. Tiasha. Um, hello. Also on my part, I'm going to present the results of our study of the impacts of Brexit on Slovenian economy, which was done uh, jointly by Professor Joža Damian, Ch Professor Čert Kostelz and uh, myself. Um, so 10 minutes is a really short uh, time to summarize uh, comprehensively uh, the results presented on about 100 pages, so I will do my best to nonetheless provide you a picture of the key uh, results. Um, so if 20 or 30 years ago, uh, countries were unanimous in their desire to join this elite club in the hope that trade will stimulate um, their growth, and if there was a global consensus that trade is uh, good for economic growth, that the globalizers grow faster, um, Brexit is a natural experiment in the opposite uh, direction. So we are looking forward to seeing the results also from uh, the academic uh, perspective. Now, uh, due to the role, the size of the uh, UK economy, both in Europe and also globally, of course, there have been uh, several studies done uh, since Brexit became um, an issue um, in political talks and then the referendum. So I will start with this to give you an overview of what has been done as an introduction to the results of uh, Slovenia. So um, generally the studies, as you can see, are unanimous in their evaluation that the impact will be the strongest on the UK economy. We also heard the numbers about the trade um, relations with UK 
uh, towards the EU. So you can see that um, over the period, now the studies here depend, the results depend on the model that was used to assess the impact. There are several models, so computable general equilibrium model, or global trade um, econometric model, um, and other models as well. And they evaluate the cumulative results over a period of 10 or 20 years, depending on the model that is being used. So you can see that the uh, results show that the UK is expected to lose from 7.7 .7 to about 0.6% of GDP over a long period of time. Overall, the impact is expected to be negative also on the EU, but the loss is much smaller, so cumulatively from 0.7 to 0.1 percent. And some of the studies even included Slovenia as part of the um, assessment. And you can see here that the evaluated impact um, is also small from a percent loss to basically no change at all, 0.0. .0 five, which is basically nothing. So um, our task was to provide a more detailed evaluation of the impacts of Slovenia uh, using, uh, on one hand, uh, the global uh, trade um, analysis model, a macroeconomic simulation, but we also used uh, a series of interviews and a survey to provide additional explanation of why something might happen or mechanisms that are behind these macroeconomic results. Um, so the effects on Slovenia, the cumulative effects uh, uh, using the GTAP model um, with three different scenarios possible. So last year when we were doing this, it was not yet clear what might happen. So basically now we know that hard Brexit is not um, an option um, which is realistically going to happen. So most likely scenario three, soft Brexit, uh, which is negotiating a similar uh, status as other uh, free trade um, agreements or in the worst case scenario probably the colleagues here from Britain will have a better um, idea of how far the talks um, are and what can go uh, wrong but most likely even scenario two is um, too uh, negative. In any case you can see that uh, the percent change in GDP so this is cumulative loss over the period of 10 years is minus 0.1%, so basically no change at all. And this is also really low, the change is also low in the percentage change of uh, total exports. Now th these are the total results which take into consideration both the direct and the di indirect effects of trade creation, trade destruction and trade diversion. So basically the model expects that trade flows will go in a different route as was mentioned before and this is the cumulative effect. This is not just UK-Slovenia effect but this is the total effect of Brexit through the changes in trade structure, trade flows, trade directions on Slovenian economy in total, so both GDP and um, exports. Now, um, of course, um, employment is also expected to change a bit, so this is here negative overall. In total, the simulations show that uh, we might lose from 240 to 840 employees in total. So to just put that into perspective, at the moment we have about 950,000 people in job, jobs either as self-employed or the majority, of course, as employed. So basically, again, a really minor and non-significant results. Even the quarter-to-quarter -quarter fluctuations in Slovenia are about 5,000 people. So this is really, as a cumulative effect over 10 years, small. Um, of course, sectoral differences might appear. Now, um, again, this is a cumulative result over 10 years, which is expected based on past trade structure. Trade structure, US company representatives know best how things change over the period of 10 years, not just because of the um, economic cycles, economic changes, but also technological changes. So our Slovenian economy might be in 10 years completely different. So um, in any case, uh, positive um, impacts might be expected in vehicles, processed food, chemical industry, also meat production, leather, while wood processing, paper, um, and some other industries might lose a bit. Again, these are forecasted um, changes over the period of 10 
um, years. Um, now, um, in overall, the results show that the expected impact is going to be small, which is not surprising given the um, numbers that we saw before, so 500 million um, in total, whereas uh, the total exports goods and services is over 80% of GDP in Slovenia. So the results are expected. Now, just to provide um, a, a bit more um, insight into how companies see Brexit, how you prepared um, for the process, we conducted a series of interviews. We got uh, over 300 uh, responses from companies and I would like to thank everybody who helped us not just with the survey but also with the interviews so about 20 interviews to provide some additional um, insight as well. Now first we asked companies how important is the UK market as export market and import market here you can see the importance as export market now first of all what you can see clearly is that Slovenian companies as you know, focus most on European markets, so EU 15 and other European markets, then followed by the domestic markets, so only about 20% of companies, um, uh, sorry, 10% uh, of companies um, mentioned UK to be important and about 20% of companies mentioned former Yugoslavian markets to be important uh, markets. Um, now, um, in comparison to other trade negotiations which have been really intense um, in the past few years from TTIP, uh, CETA and um, Mercosur uh, trade agreements and other, um, companies were much more interested in Brexit. So it's close, it's a, an economy we all know much better, it's much more um, important, closer to us. So um, you can see that um, about 60, slightly slower, uh, lower than 60% of companies mentioned that they know either moderately well or very well the process of Brexit. And not only that, they also knew the different scenarios. Um, if you would ask an average company what we were doing as well, do you know the trade talks with Latin America? Not as relevant. Um, by far not as relevant. So Brexit is close and is important to Slovenian um, companies and they were following the process closely, primarily stressing the problem of uncertainty. So there were informations changing from day to day and this was a real um, issue that was constantly mentioned in the interviews in particular. Um, now companies also um, were preparing for Brexit. So um, first of all, you can see that over um, 30%, so roughly a third of companies, determined possible consequences of Brexit on their company. Um, and also about 20% prepared measures for different Brexit scenarios, which is really important to see um, that companies are getting ready and thinking about what to do. Um, in the interviews, we um, saw that some companies were already trying to increase the stocks they have in Britain and they mentioned that the first feeling of why that Brexit is really happening or is expected to happen was uh, noticed in the increasing prices of storage in the UK. So a very practical consequence but um, qu quite uh, likely. And companies also mentioned that they're considering new markets. So we saw in the data that the UK market is not the biggest market. So as a consequence, companies are looking on how to compensate for this loss in other markets, although they are aware of the possible increased con um, competition in those other markets because it won't be just them changing the strategy and refocusing to other uh, markets. But overall, companies are quite optimistic. They don't expect significant negative uh, consequences. Um, now, what was also interesting to see, we also asked, of course, the companies, what is the expected impact um, of Brexit on EU economy, UK economy, Slovenian economy, Slovenian big companies, SMEs, your sector and your company. There's one interesting pattern because we've asked these questions for other trade talks as well. When it comes to the company, the, the respondent is from, basically you're not pessimistic at all. The average evaluation, if, if you check the last line, is that 60% of companies believe that Brexit will have no impact on their company. 
On the other hand, of course, probably also because of the presence of the news in the media, the overall evaluation on the EU economy, UK economy, Slovenian economy, and of course the big companies, it's going to be negative. But for us, nah, it's not going to be that important. So overall, probably because you know your company's best, the last part is most um, important. Um, so not a highly negative um, outlook. Um, and just to conclude with some um, directions for future talks, uh, companies, what would they would like to see um, in the future, in the relationships UK-EU, is primarily freedom, okay? Free movement of goods, services, uh, people, low administrative barriers, keeping the regulation as it is now valid in both EU and the UK, and primarily also in the last line, a quick solution to the uncertainty. So regardless of what happens, tell us what's gonna happen so that we can um, adjust. So this was the um, result, so keep the freedom and end the uncertainty. And I would like to thank you for the attention, and if you have any questions, the study is online. If you can't find it, feel free to send me an email and I'll send you the link. Thank you. Thank you, Tiasha, Riedek, <coughs> and Boen Ivans. Now we will move on to the last part of our event this morning, and it's a panel discussion, and I will hand the microphone over now to Yuri Giacomeli, who will lead this panel discussion. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, good morning, everyone. From my side, it's uh, really a, a pleasure, and, and, and I'm really honored to uh, stand here in front of you. Uh, this packed uh, um, hall on the seventh floor of the uh, Chambers of Commerce uh, office, I think, has a, has some significance. Uh, so when uh, Mr. Abrahams um, uh, recalled back to the year 2004, I thought, well. I mean, the first thing to do before going into the debate uh, about what businesses will face in, in, in uh, the next months and years, I think what, first of all, we have to uh, admit is, I mean, wholeheartedly, yes, we are sorry that the, the Brits go away, and across Europe uh, we are sorry, and Slovenia is just, just as much as uh, I believe, but his, the historic stand of Slovenia, we can recall the, uh, the, about the, you know, the 30th anniversary of independence, that the, 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 um, the right for independence is never consumed, and so wholeheartedly we can congratulate uh, the, uh, the UK to um, have made the Brexit done and uh, to, to implement the, um, uh, the, um, the decision, uh, the referendum, no matter how much bitterness or disappointment it may have brought even to, 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 to some of um, uh, the, the country citizens. So now we are past the Brexit period and now we are in a transition period, right? So we would like to discuss this and we see uh, some future there. So I believe this uh, turnout uh, shows that we are uh, headed towards um, uh, the future and, and uh, we are also I think in this country we are quite good at transitions, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a year of transition, so I think we all sense that there may be some opportunities uh, in this year or during the uh, negotiation uh, period, and uh, we've heard that, that there would be some negotiations <laughs> uh, happening uh, from, from the initial um, um, speeches, um, but there will also be some perhaps much more important changes that may uh, have been sensed through, uh, I mean, uh, through the uh, interviews that, that tried to capture the sentiment in, in the first, uh, I mean, before, before, um, um, before the end of uh, January this year, um, if, if we take this, this date as a, a, a break prior to date. So uh, we are at the home of the Chamber of Commerce, right, at the home of the, of, of the business, and I would like to invite the two businessmen from my, my distinguished uh, panel to, uh, uh, um, to sh acquaint us with their view of how they were awaiting what, 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 was, what happened and how they are awaiting uh, the next steps. Mr. Bozo Cernila, the CEO of Trimo, uh, Trimie, please uh, join me uh, together uh, with Mr. Janis Mikkel, the sales manager of uh, 2HM uh, Logistics, a logistics uh, company seated in uh, Koper in, uh, in Slovenia. Uh, this is, I would like you to tell us how you were looking at the Brexit, how do you feel now when it's done, and how do, are you, do you await um, the um, 
negotiation uh, period. Mr. Cernila, you uh, are the, uh, the innovative producer of construction uh, panels, and so it's a lot of goods moving uh, uh, here and back, so I, I believe the nature of business will, will change. Uh, what is your sentiment at the moment? Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, look, I, we took in uh, Trimo a very pragmatic approach toward the Brexit. Yeah? Uh, what one needs to understand that when you are in the companies, eh, you have changing environment all the time. So now expect something is going to be stable and super and for next 20 years it won't happen. Eh? You simply you need to be careful. And as it was mentioned, there was uh, quite some agreements and negotiations for agreements uh, running recently also this uh, USA agreement with China, then uh, quotes with still in between USA and European Union, which all impact the business. And also when we are looking the perspective of Brexit for us as a global competing company is simple like that, that it's not just what will happen UK, EU from relationship Slovenia and UK, but also how this is going to impact other European markets, which are also important for us. So it's uh, not uh, some specific thing. We evaluating Brexit as an event, not a trend, hopefully, yeah? and we will react. So uh, we have strong position as a company on UK market. We are in premium segments. It's our fourth uh, most important market by site. We are monitoring carefully what is going on with uh, uh, tariffs, taxes, what is going on with uh, standards and product related legislation. And of course, uh, labor legislation because we know that in the construction business uh, construction where we are competing, labor is very intensive. And last but not least, I'm hoping those three will not change, but less optimistic after this morning, listening the complication possible during the process of agreement, getting the agreement. And what we know for sure that some administrati administrative uh, processes are going to change and for us this is normal because we are also exporting today in the non-European countries. Yeah. Uh, you. The, the the things that are coming out of your um, shop floor are quite encumbered, but uh, are you, I mean, large panels used in, in different um, segments of construction. However, are you more present in uh, with services or with products, with physical products in, in, in the UK? And the second question, do you get your products there through the third European EU countries or uh, do you trade directly? Uh, we trade directly. Uh, we generate revenues 85% with products, 15% with services. So, and we have long-lasting relationship with partners in UK. We do have sales uh, legal entity company in UK, which is in charge of that business. Then, uh, what we see basically as, uh, and this should ends hopefully end of this year this uncertainty which was mentioned a uh, few times today already because long lasting partners are looking for backup if something will go wrong and when we try to acquire new accounts it's also yeah uh, it's a slower process as it would be if we wouldn't have this uncertainty in place. Okay. So the uncertainty should stop, as we have heard um, um, uh, also from Jasha. But the nature of business will inevitably change. And a logistics company like, like yours, um, Mr. Mikkel, um, definitely uh, is, in, is there to help other businesses uh, go past uh, any possible uh, problems that may sense already or they may, may w uh, encounter in, in the near future. How do you feel this with your customers? Do they ask you questions? What kind of questions do they ask? Are you already uh, trying to design some new services or new, new, new approaches? How do you monitor what's going to happen? Thank you, Yuri. Uh, good day to all, um, Your Excellency. Um, first of all, Brexit as it is, um, in logistics uh, we see it as an opportunity, we see it as a challenge, uh, we look forward actually to give a hand to business uh, partners as Mr. Bojo 
stated. So, um, so there will be more business for you. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> uh, more added value services uh, arise uh, from perspective. Now we will have a border, so custom clearance, for instance. Um, moreover, um, you mentioned uh, customers asking questions and so on. Uh, already in 2019, uh, in January, uh, customers stated questions, oh, what is happening, uh, what, is, what will happen in one month? And our response was, let's wait, let's follow the indications that come from uh, governmental side, from regulative side. So um, what we can do is, as I s said before, um, give a hand to business uh, partners and be there as a logistic provider. So um, yeah, that's our job. And we're looking forward to Brexit. It's so the nature of your services will change, but w will you also attract inevitably or by your own, uh, uh, through your strategy, some new customer groups? Yeah, most probably. Uh, there is a big, actually, uh, opportunity for us as well to, um, to communicate with some UK uh, representative companies that export cargo to Slovenia. Um, so, in our business, it's like this, uh, changes. Uh, Could are the, the British company trade more through Slovenia? I mean, you're seated in Koper, right? Yeah. Could this be an opportunity? Is this a chance to in, in open uh, more widely the uh, gateway to the EU for the British companies uh, through, your, uh, through the help of your services? Yeah, in that perspective, um, it's under question what will happen in this uh, period, transition period. So what kind of regulations will be set. So okay. I don't, I, I think, I'm afraid that I don't have a clear answer to this okay. question. But do you have questions? That's, that's important because today the questions yeah. really matter. I've got, for both of you, but that's just mm -hmm. to prepare you, I've got questions related to uh, the ambition set by um, uh, the UK Prime Minister to be a carbon neutral country before the e European Union, actually. So, uh, what is your major channel of transportation right now for, for the goods that you service mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to the UK in this particular case? And how do you see services developing? Because perhaps this is an, a reason that you would increase your you know, service component or maybe not. It's just to, to prepare you before we uh, get um, in, into, you know, before we broaden the topic a little bit. So for this we need uh, also other uh, panelists and uh, that's why I would like first of all to ask Mr. Tim Abrahams to come back uh, uh, to the stage and I would like to uh, invite Ambassador Isto Germek, uh, the Director General from uh, the, um, uh, responsible for the economic diplomacy from the Slovenian um, Foreign um, Ministry and of course, last but not least, uh, Mrs. Uh, Anka Pogacnik, the tax manager from Ernst & Young. Um, uh, to now we are going to we are, we are going to get back to the uh, to the carbon um, uh, to, to, uh, carbon free economy or zero carbon um, economy. The uh, but I would like the the, the, the three uh, panelists that have joined us uh, to help us understand what is changing globally. What is really changing? What, um, uh, first of all, uh, to um, Mr. Abrahams, could you explain how the UK sees um, uh, the, the themselves now in uh, uh, in terms of global trade? What and from there, what could be the priorities in uh, this negotiation uh, uh, period? Where is the? What are the sources of global competitiveness? And where is the EU in these relationships? Uh, for the more distant future, of course, not just for the, the, the year or two. Please. Indeed. I mean, what uh, the, the UK very much after uh, Brexit will be will be looking around the whole the whole world. I mean, we are very much a a, a trading nation, and that is where we get much of our uh, prosperity. So we, as I explained, will be uh, negotiating. Uh, um, we hope a free trade agreement with the EU, as, as I explained. But in parallel to that, uh, we will be um, doing similar uh, negotiations with the United States and with uh, a number of our other Japan and other major partners um, during 
the course of this year and, uh, and, and, and looking forward. Uh, because we see that 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 trade is the uh, uh, is is a big driver to uh, to competitiveness and and to prosperity. So uh, and I think in terms of um, big drivers, um, as a number of the uh, uh, the business um, folk here have already said, there are uh, an enormous number of of uncertainties and different drivers. I mean, we have. Uh, even have the, the the coronavirus has just come up upon us, and that is going to have uh, or could potentially have quite a big effect on the Chinese economy and therefore m more more widely. And that's just a, a good example of, of 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 the uncertainty. But I think one thing that is certain is going to be uh, the drive for net zero, and we might talk about that a bit later. I won't won't go, in, go into detail, but I mean that is clearly going to be one big issue where the whole world is facing a similar uh, challenge uh, and we from the UK uh, will certainly be, be looking to see where there are um, competitive and, and commercial opportunities. A risky question now for you. Huh? Uh, so you are re renegotiating your trade positions with not just the European Union um, but also with other major partners. And how long could this transition last for you? How long will it take, in your view? I mean, there's uh, obviously 11 months uh, left to go uh, to uh, close an agreement with the European Union. Uh, and we all keep uh, our fingers crossed so it will <laughs> really be only 11 months. Nevertheless, um, there is obviously, at least we can sense, a, even a longer period uh, before the EU, uh, the, the UK settles into the new position, let's let, yeah. let's call it like that. I don't think there is ever one new position. I mean, I think yeah, it is yeah. it, it is an ever um, developing position, and we will be wanting to pursue, in particular, free, free trade agreements uh, as quickly as we can. But clearly, you need to uh, uh, to make sure that they are good ones for for both sides. So, I mean, the the European Union itself has developed free trade agreements over the period of, of time uh, and we will no doubt uh, do the same so we will we will proceed as quickly as we can but in 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 our own interests is it uh, the free movement or the uh, the movement of goods the, um, a very high priority or is it about uh, uh, services particularly financial services uh, capital flows where uh, the most of the attention of the UK is going to be focused on uh, I think it's both, but clearly the uh, the UK um, about 80% of its economy is services, so uh, services are very important uh, for us. Uh, and um, from experience, uh, negotiations on services are are a complex area, but that is certainly an area that we will be wanting to concentrate on. But having said that, free movement and uh, reduction in, in tariffs across the world on, on goods is also uh, of importance to us. Okay. And thank you very much for now. Mr. Uh, Germek, um, what changes for Slovenia now in the terms of, I mean, uh, on the, uh, in terms of ge geopolitics, but of course, in, a, in practical terms, for businesses, what really changes with Brexit? Given the fact that there, w that, that there will be no, actually no immediate effect, but we can sense that the businesses want uh, this uh, transition period to be as short as, uh, as possible. And most probably, Slovenian businesses are much more affected through, uh, uh, through third parties, to, uh, due to the t flows through third parties, right? Yes. Uh, please. Well, uh, Mr. Giacomelli, first of all, thank you for inviting uh, me for this yes. panel. And c you congratulations right. to Ambassador Hani and to Director Uraniek. Yeah. To raise such uh, attention of this event, uh, I think this hall is almost too small. And I'm especially glad that so many uh, business representatives are here of the Slovenian uh, business, uh, if in uh, companies which are doing business in UK. That's also, I'm very pleased that uh, two colleagues are on the panel. Uh, well, uh, about the geopolitics, uh, first I would like to say that uh, Britain is not going e anywhere, it stays in Europe. Uh, okay, it's not on the continent, but just next to it. 
Uh, and uh, from our point of view, uh, we definitely follow this with uh, a great attention. We uh, also organize the briefings like this six, seven times with the Slovenian company, so it's a process going on. I, I will try to be optimistic, but also realistic, uh, because uh, actually in the process of Brexit so far, uh, it was not an easy process. And actually, uh, now the process is turned upside down because uh, the first we thought that uh, first there will there will, there will be negotiations and then we'll have a, a, you know a split. But on the other now it's going opposite. Well, first we decided about the divorce and now we will uh, discuss all the all the elements of uh, this uh, divorce and we have only one one uh, year uh, for that and uh, we heard from the EU ambassador. Uh, the uh, both sides have uh, the chance till the 1st of July to, to discuss about the prolongation of this process. We'll see what will happen. And uh, we're to uh, present some data which were not uh, uh, presented so far. Uh, well, uh, of course, we're following what's going on bilaterally uh, between Slovenia and the United Kingdom. And uh, there was a constant growth. Uh, well, with statistics, you can do a lot of things, uh, as uh, Mr. Ivan showed and uh, Mrs. Redak, Professor Redak. But OK, the, the fact is that uh, we have a uh, status quo. 2018, 2019, uh, the growth stopped uh, in uh, trade of goods, trade of services. Uh, I, I'm confident that this is not only uh, due to the Brexit, uh, there are also some other uh, elements of cooling down the economy, and especially we expect a very turbulent uh, 2020. Uh, of course, we dealt yesterday the whole morning with the shipping of uh, Slovenian goods with the first EU plane uh, to, to Wuhan. Uh, so this uh, coronavirus will definitely, like uh, Director Abraham uh, said, uh, will they, they, it will definitely uh, affect uh, the European economy, including the, the UK economy. Uh, you are from the logistics business. If you check the, the shippings from uh, coming out uh, from the Far East, in uh, two, three weeks, we'll, uh, automotive, uh, European automotive and some other companies will have problems because the supplies from uh, far, far, uh, Asia, far East are, are not uh, on the ships as they were supposed to be. Then uh, what I want to say is also that uh, among this risk, uh, of course, uh, there is a risk of uh, uh, Chinese, uh, US uh, uh, the trade relations. And Brexit is also, uh, from our point of view, the issue of uncertainty. And also from the, uh, from the point of view of the Slovenian economy, we are very much afraid of what, went, uh, what happened in 2009. So, uh, that's why the uh, uh, issue of Brexit is so important. Uh, well, uh, as uh, Dr. Redek uh, uh, presented, we will not be uh, directly affected uh, by, by uh, Brexit, by our trade relations. Uh, UK is for Slovenia a very important partner, but okay, it's 19th in the statistics. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, UK is a crucial partner for our major uh, economic partners like uh, the neighbors, so Italians, Austrians, Germans. Uh, and uh, if uh, there will be a bigger effect of uh, Brexit on those economies, uh, we can uh, expect the uh, secondary impact also on uh, what is going on uh, in our economy. So to cut it short, we, deep, we regret and we deeply respect the it's, uh, UK decision is uh, the proof that democracy functions in Europe. Uh, uh, we uh, have respect for that the, the British government implemented Brexit. It was the bill uh, uh, clearly presented uh, on the referendum and uh, we go uh, uh, on and uh, uh, yesterday we joked with uh, uh, Director Abraham. I have, a, I have a here a tie of the UK presidency from 2005, and hopefully maybe our kids, uh, my son, will wear a presidency tie with the UK in 2040, maybe for example. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, still, to be, I mean, this. Is a morning where many questions should be allowed, right? So uh, let me start with, with some um, like that. <laughs> uh, are we more preoccupied with how Germans, or I mean German businesses, or Italian, as, as you said, or, or uh, fr uh, France businesses feel about uh, the new age? Uh, and um, do we have a plan? Do we have, uh, you know, some clues about how? Um, 
perhaps a, a bad deal uh, in 11 months or whenever it, 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 it'll be done can uh, affect the, uh, the trade among the two, let's say the EU and, and uh, the UK, in, in a longer term, let's say in the midterm. Is this something that we should be preoccupied? Well, uh, it's very simple about mathematics. I think we have 10 months. So today is the 12th of February and uh, nobody will work for Christmas, uh, I think even the negotiators. So it's not a lot of time. Uh, second, uh, what we are doing, of course, we have a modest, uh, compared to the United Kingdom, uh, network of diplomatic representations. And, uh, of course, our embassies uh, in uh, Berlin, in Paris, in Rome, in Madrid, uh, maybe also in Warsaw, they, they, we ask them to analyze what, what uh, we follow, what will this will mean also for these economies. So, actually, we really focus uh, uh, how this will affect the, the common European market. And uh, maybe also, we, uh, we know now, we recently learned a little bit more about uh, CETA. Uh, we are organizing, by the way, a big trade mission to Canada end of uh, end of March, and uh, I, I, I'm well, as far as I understand, CETA it's uh, not the best option. Like uh, Ambassador Stanchi said, uh, I hope this is not modus vivendi uh, for uh, for UK or for for uh, Europe because. Canada, it's an important big country, but still cannot be compared to the relations of uh, economies of Canada and the EU compared to what is the relation between United Kingdom and, and the European Union. So, and also uh, about CETA, we also learned this, uh, like uh, Ambassador Stanchit said, it took uh, six hours and uh, the ratification period is still not over. And also the ratification period uh, for uh, the Brexit will take uh, after the negotiations also 27 member countries and uh, we'll have to uh, uh, ratify the, 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 the deal done. So to cut it short and uh, directly to your question, uh, from the Slovenian perspective, uh, of course, uh, we are a relatively small numbered country, small, small economy, and that means that we are more flexible and uh, I'm confident that Trimo and uh, 2 HM, uh, like you said, you are, you are, you are uh, eager uh, that uh, it's a challenge for you that the Brexit is happening, it's a good business for you. So I hope that uh, this flexibility that Slovenia has will work out also to promote uh, the, the new, uh, to use uh, the new situation. And uh, uh, I would like also to say, well, Britain is uh, get, getting a status of the third, uh, uh, third uh, country for us, but we have uh, perfect examples of booming uh, uh, certain areas of bilaterals uh, with uh, the countries like Japan, uh, Korea, not to mention China, for example. So, so I hope that you are, I replied to your question. Mm, absolutely, and uh, we are staying with you, and we are joining in Mrs. Uh, uh, Pogacnik. We heard, in a way, the starting points of these negotiations that, um, um, from the U.S. standpoint, we understood uh, uh, something like uh, that uh, free trade uh, with the trade agreement with, with Canada would be a desirable framework. Let's say uh, we heard from Mrs. Stanchich that. Uh, uh, the uh, European Union sees uh, the situation more like uh, the relationships with, let's say, Northern Mac Macedonia at the moment, I mean, uh, as an association uh, agreement, which comprises <coughs> or may comprise many more areas than just, let's say, trade or commercial um, um, uh, relationships. Um, how do you see, Mrs. Uh, Pogacnik, uh, how do you see um, this um, can um, evolve, particularly? When we um, talk about um, the uh, differences in taxation uh, policies in the, the, the mid future, let's say. Mm -hmm. Please. So first of all, thank you for the invitation, and I would like to say hello to everyone. So on taxes, we're living in a changing world, and Brexit is one of these changes. So I was surprised that so many companies is actually um, aware of Brexit and uh, different scenarios. So 30 percent but almost 60% of the companies say, okay, this will not, not have an impact to us. And I'm sure they feel this in a financial way, but the work behind it is a huge one. So uh, despite of this transition period, I believe there will be uh, quite significant changes uh, operational-wise and also supply chain. 
And um, the most questions we received last year from the UK companies, not so much from Slovenians, uh, they were more or less focused on quick fixes, I would say, uh, was how what to do in Slovenia. Because now they are also in the transition period, they are considered as a EU country, so they sell goods or purchase goods as intra-community supply and acquisition. But afterwards, there will be imports, exports. UK companies will be third country-based companies. They will have to appoint fiscal representatives in Slovenia. And there was, um, there was this um, uh, request where we can find help who will be our customs agent. There was increased uh, demand for, for logistic companies to assist them. So this was actually one of the main questions they were dealing last year. Um, so I see there will be difference in taxation on other areas, not just from UK companies, but also Slovenian companies, and they should now use this transition period to identify the areas. One is customs, we already heard about this, and import-export procedures, what they should do. Of course, if this will be free trade uh, agreement without tariffs, um, this without quotas, this is really for, co for companies, but what if not? What will be the impact? Um, they should already start thinking about this now. Uh, then it's VAT, obviously, um, because now you can use certain simplifications and with quick, quick fixes, which were implemented across EU with the start of this year, uh, the, the, the changes with UK after the end of this year may be quite significant for Slovenian companies which trade with UK companies, so they're selling purchasing goods, or they use UK intermediaries. Uh, we heard about um, uh, oil and gas industries, so trade with petroleum. And these companies are, uh, UK companies usually act as intermediaries. What this means for Slovenian companies purchasing goods from them, and also for, for UK companies. Uh, so we see there quite big impact. In, in short, how, how will the VAT accounting change uh, unless we agree otherwise. Uh, well, VAT, I think VAT will change anyway. Anyway, uh, It will be like with third countries. Uh, so companies which have experience with it, such as Trimo, will do this easily. Some companies which don't uh, will, will be more affected because they will have to uh, get the knowledge, check if they have the knowledge in-house. But also for companies such as Trimo and for bigger companies which are aware of consequences, have you, are you ready for different scenarios, uh, IT-wise, people-wise? Will they know which customer to tick uh, now? Because in certain IT systems do not enable to open, uh, to change the customer status, but you have to open a new customer. Uh, do you know which customer to tick to record in the transition period? After this, so this will be important, and it's also opportunity to check the compliance, overall compliance. Um, we mentioned also one thing, it's also very important, mobility, uh, migration. We know something about the, the people who are already in UK and will be there or in Slovenia in this transition peri period, but what afterwards? What about social security system and um, inclusion? Can they be still included in the home? social security system or not for the people who will go to UK afterwards. So this is the second area. Third one, it's also very important, it's um, dividend income, interest income royalties and application of EU, uh, EU directives. So for the income going to, to um, from Slovenia to UK. Uh, there was also one question and I would li like to address holding companies. So uh, this is also one of the main topics uh, because a lot of holding companies are set in, in uh, UK because of the application of uh, UK law. Um, but uh, here we, we can expect changes not only because of the Brexit, but I would also like to point uh, the company should check uh, how, EU, EU, how UK law will be, could be applied for the future transactions or in case of future transactions the same as now, or there will be changes also in respect of enforcement of legal dec dec decrees, but it's also BIPs. So, so, so excuse me, when it comes to uh, the holding companies, do you expect some redistribution, so uh, different reasons why 
keeping or establishing a holding company in the, in the UK or abandoning uh, the UK uh, for, for, for some other reasons? Uh, do I you see this movement coming? I, I would say this do you see already it happening? Mm -hmm. I would say not because of the Brexit, but it's, uh, the, it's broader story. It's also BEPS and substance requirements. Um, and of course, this, this is a developing story. So uh, I would say this is also one where we can expect, so holding companies change of supply chains. Thank you. Um, dear um, guests, please, there's time for your questions now. Uh, it's very simple, you just raise your hand, we will bring you a microphone and uh, you, will, you, you will be able to address a question to all the panelists or maybe just to some of them. Uh, please don't hesitate uh, to uh, ask questions or to leave even to leave this event bef uh, without uh, satisfying your uh, curiosity, please. Um, and um, le let me let me go further from uh, from where we, <laughs> we interrupted you. Um, do you um, expect some positive impact on businesses? And this is also, of course, to the gentleman here, given the fact that we may have two competitive tax environments near uh, uh, nearby. Even e even now, when we have you know with so much fatigue, we, we, when we have just fixed. Uh, oh no, the financial sector, the banking sector, and established all this beautiful safety net. And now the, the, you know, the Brits have gone. So how do you see the development? Do, do, are we going to have the two competitive um, environments, let's say, especially for, for financial services or for holding companies just as much? Please. Yeah, I think this already exists now. Uh, so and uh, because business is uh, flexible and they, they have to seize the opportunity when they see this, I think there will be a competition, of course, of course. Um, so businesses should actually like this fact? Yeah, I think so, yeah. They, they can optimize their supply chain, their structures. Uh, they can also, um, because it's not just about optimization, but check if they already do things right now. So it's also compliance issue. And yeah, this le leads into increased transparency. So I think uh, all the changes are challenging, but they also bring opportunities. So uh, potentially lower taxation in the UK can force even the European Union to be more m more efficient and more competitive from from, from tax perspective, right? And um, uh, back to, uh, to, to Mr. Abrahams, um, uh, the Europeans are afraid that there will be, you know, tax competition and dumping. How w are you going to comfort them so they will negotiate more uh, willingly? Uh, well, I, th I think uh, you need to, to look at our, at our record. I mean, there is, as, as, as you were saying, uh, I mean, there is competition already within the European Union and, um, uh, and countries are, are competing and the tax regimes are not all the same across the European Union. Uh, and that will remain whether the UK now that the UK is, is 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 out. So I mean I think there is a there's a wider issue about uh, yes dumping in general and and the ambassador was uh, was mentioning that. And I think you you have to to look at 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 the UK's record and in a lot of areas where there is a fear of dumping. Actually, our standards are are very high, and so we've led led the uh, the EU uh, and certainly gone further than than the EU standards uh, say in um, uh, time off for uh, maternity cover paternity cover uh, in terms of the environment um, back to net zero we we, we were the first major economy to say, right, in law we are going to have, uh, we're going to, to, to aim for net zero, or we are going to have a legal requirement for net zero by 2050. So in all these areas, uh, we, we have high standards and we will want to maintain them. So I think that the fear of dumping is, uh, uh, is, is, is not really uh, justified. So it, there could also be, especially when you talk about the carbon neutrality, there could be also new uh, points of convergence or of uh, uh, cooperative action, I believe. Um, uh, so uh, back to the uh, to gentleman um, from the start. How, how do you see this um, uh, carbon neutrality as a potential uh, encouragement, let's say, and, and uh, the, the, the factor of dynamics uh, in your respective businesses? 
Yeah, from our perspective, uh, industry is really working and putting a lot of struggle um, to um, introduce new technologies and new means of transport that would uh, reduce uh, these uh, carbon emissions. But yeah, it's a long, long, long step. It's still a journey. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's still a journey, yeah. Mm. It will be a marathon, I think. Yeah. The construction business is uh, very much tackled by that, right? Uh, yes, indeed. And, you know, we as a Trimo, we are already today front runner with our products on this uh, respective area. Uh, and what we like a lot is if the UK is going to be uh, to speed it up, that this even creates more preferable markets for us. And uh, we believe uh, clearly that we are going to be even more successful. And I can confirm also that all the standards and legislation requirements on the UK building construction markets are today above uh, average European markets. That means for us easier to compete because we are on the top of the uh, product uh, range which competition is offering in our industry. And uh, we're just hoping that this is going to be even increased, not uh, to decrease, but there are no signs to decrease the standards which are already implemented. Just for the, to encourage everybody, you know, go to UK because it's a good market. Last year we grow UK 58% uh, on the revenues. And so we see very, very good uh, dynamic and we are very positive. And this, operational, administrative, all tax issues, will solve it on the way. Uh, we hear my colleague said, uh, okay, he has some more hope for some new revenues. Uh, for me, that means more costs, of course, eh? uh, using these services, but that's life, that's how it goes. Mm. I've got two very simple questions still. Uh, what is going to happen? I mean, the, the UK is not just a financial hub, it's also a hub for education and um, uh, the, uh, the, um, we, we are well aware of the um, excellent university system that attracts, also thanks of course to the uh, widespread English uh, language across the world, uh, many students also from, from Slovenia. What do you expect can change? Uh, with this uh, in, in, in this part and uh, more broadly do you think this can be a part of let's say the association agreement uh, as the Europeans call it um, I think what I what I will say about uh, about the, the the education side I mean uh, as you say we are we are fortunate to be uh, blessed with the uh, the English language and uh, that that helps uh, a, a great deal and we enormously welcome uh, the um, uh, bright students from Slovenia and and indeed across across the world uh, I mean what I can say is that during the the, the transition period so this year uh, all students who, who start uh, on university courses will continue finish as under these conditions uh, they will finish if under they study condition, well indeed. yeah, yeah. Um, what is up for up for negotiation um, and, and decision later in the year is exactly what we will take take from there. But I mean, we from from the UK's point of view, uh, we benefit greatly from students coming in um, both directly commercially, but also probably more more significantly from what they add to the country. So uh, we are certainly not going to be closing our doors. Thank you. This is the last call, ladies and gentlemen. Is there a question on your side? Please, there, there's a question. Potrebovali bi na svet, kako ne oblikujemo cene, pogovarjamo se za dobavo blaga, kjer je pač delo preme prihaja iz Velike Britanije, pogodba bo sklenjena za obdobje dveh let in mi moramo definirati cene zdaj, šlo bo pa za sukcesivne dobave in v bistvu ne znamo zračunati cene. Which company is that? What company is that? CGS Labs, CGS. The industry? Software and bom povedala po slovensko prodajamo merilno tehniko za okolje. There's a measurement technique and obviously software-backed service that this company would like to price well and prepare for the subsequent 
deliveries, right, for the many years to come, and uh, they are seeking for some advice. Anybody? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, really good one. Um, at the moment, we can provide you with all the rates regarding the transport costs, but unfortunately, um, due to transition period, we can set all the additional costs regarding the import cost and clearance or export cost and clearance. Um, maybe the basics, but not 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 precise ones. So, yeah, that would be. So also, I think taxes are very relevant when you are agreeing on prices. But at this moment, I think uh, there are still open questions. So, um, w what I would uh, recommend is to to kind of uh, because this is a developing thing, and it really depends on the the uh, conditions of the contract, how you will actually uh, define this supply, this supply with installation, when you will it's a turnkey thing. Uh, so uh, to 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 uh, kind of leave things which are open, still open. So discuss with uh, with, uh, with the supplier who will bear which cost if these costs occur. Mm -hmm. So I think this is also one possibility where you're not sure uh, what will be uh, the, the end um, also uh, trade agreement. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I, s I will leave my last question unanswered, but I'll tell you what the question is. I really wonder how much a Slovenian, you know, bottle of a Slovenian wine would cost, you know, three years down the road from uh, from now, in in, in a nice uh, shop in London. But let's discuss this um, in the informal part of the event. Or of the event, there has been so much information, and I really would really like to thank to all the panelists, to all the introductory speakers um, b b before us, um, for sharing their thoughts um, and uh, trying to help with the best possible answers at this point. Given the fact that there have been there, there's so much uh, has been said, uh, we are going to learn now what what, what we what we actually have learned, and uh, we that's why I would like to introduce our last speaker, the keynote listener, uh, Mr. Matej Rogel, the director of uh, the, the Center for International Cooperation at, at uh, this institution at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Slovenia. Mr. Matej Rogel, please, the word is yours. Join us here on the stage, and thank you. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for attending. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you for enabling me to become a qualified listener, whatever that is. I think the thing with listening is, you know, they don't tell you everything. Uh, perhaps you forgot to, to ask or they just don't know. What I heard today is that, uh, which is strike a little bit interesting to me, that the Brexit problem is a technicality. It looks like it is reduced to how we will do the documents, how will we you know, move the goods. So this is what we are uh, talking about. And we can well adapt to that. We said that we are doing this already with the third countries and we can do it easily also, also with the UK. But what, what is the essence of the business? What does it change really into our minds, into our approaches? We tackled <coughs> today the carbon free issue this is maybe or even the coronavirus although it doesn't have anything to do with it but in any case in terms of technicalities what uh, i understood the companies expect uh, uh, uncertainty to stop they want to have simplicity they want to have rules and they want to have rules implemented in a clear and easy way so most of the companies, British and Slovenia, would just say, well, go ahead with it, just, just do it, do something. We will adapt, we always adapt, and uh, we just uh, move a little bit difficult from our comfort zone, but the changes are the part of the life. They are happening every day, so we should adapt to them, we should embrace them. Uh, some companies uh, even see this as an opportunity. Uh, and, uh, even, as I understood, they first, at the first uh, supposed deadlines, the companies started piling uh, the security stocks. Uh, they stopped that now, because they feel that they don't need it. They will just, you know, wait what happens and they will adapt. Uh, in the, uh, and it's easy to deal with goods, we know that. But we've heard today that uh, 
uh, there's 80% uh, of services within the UK economy. So what happens with the services? This is maybe the better question because goods are easy. Also, also uh, Slovenia uh, is, is easy. Uh, we will do what Germans do. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the, the thing, the problem is how, well, maybe not a problem, but how do we deal with, uh, with Poles, with French, with Scots? Uh, so the negotiation first might take place inside this, uh, inside EU, inside uh, UK. But in any case, uh, it looks like that uh, since we only tackled the, the, the problem of carbon-free uh, economy, for example, that somehow we need, we eagerly wait uh, for some external uh, causes from some uh, waiting for some new disruptive technology maybe that will integrate us that will divert our attention and our effort to other things that are maybe more important for example will we save the world by 2050 so until that until then dear British the door is open <laughs> and we can go both ways uh, we should just put the threshold, set the threshold high enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matej Rogel. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this morning. Uh, we're here uh, to answer any questions on Brexit. Uh, the British Embassy, the British Slovene Chamber of Commerce, the National Co uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Before we let you go, I'd like to invite you to our next event, which will be in Koper on the 18th of March. And uh, I wish you a great day. Thank you for coming. <laughs>